Thank you for coming to this session, which is Chronicles of the Nephilim, the Ancient Biblical Story. And what that means is I'm the author of the novel series, uh, Chronicles of the Nephilim. It's a category bestseller on Amazon.com. And what I'm going to do today, my goal is I'm going to explain the storyline thread that goes through the Bible that I call the War of the Seed. And um, <clears throat> this storyline, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Uh, this storyline is is the the, the storyline that, that I'm using in my novel series. So, so to start out though, I want to start with these passages. Sorry if it's too small for you to read up there, but I'm going to start out sort of before the beginning. And these are in Job and Psalms. We read about the sons of God. This is the, the heavenly council, the divine council, the host of heaven, and. Uh, we read in Job 38, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God are there when God created and they shouted for joy. So these are, these are divine beings in heaven. Job 1.6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And in Psalm 89 we read about, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the gods is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones. So some of the points here that, that you should be seeing is before, before creation, God had a divine council around him. And they, it's an assembly. It's an assembly of the heavenly host. They're called by many names. Sons of God, holy ones, right? There are other names too. The host of heaven. We'll see that a little bit later too. But it's an assembly around his throne, and they have these multiple names. They're the, the divine beings before, before the creation. Next, we have Genesis 3.15. Now, this is what we call the Proto-Evangelion, the first reference to Messianic redemption in the Bible. But it happens in the garden. And God is talking to the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall, you, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is God talking to Satan in the garden. It's the curse on him. And take notice of that word offspring. That word offspring in Hebrew actually means seed. So this is where the war of the seed begins. And keep in mind that he's talking about the seed of the serpent, your seed versus the seed of the woman, her seed. So the seed of the serpent versus the seed of Eve. This is the war of the seed, the enmity between them. And also notice that the word, cru uh, word bruise there actually in Hebrew also kind of means crush. I think the translators were afraid of like writing that because it, they thought it didn't make sense. You will crush his head, he will crush your head, you shall crush his heel. What does that mean, right? But I think that the, the, we get the essence there, don't we? Right? There's this a serious crushing going on on both sides. There's, there's that war and there's, there's damage done on both sides. Now we jump ahead to Genesis 6, 1 through 4. If you're at this conference, you probably are very familiar with this passage, right? When, the men, when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, remember the sons of God, saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Now this is a controversial passage. I'm not here to arg make arguments for interpretations. I want to give you my interpretation and just sort of f go with me, follow, follow me. Um, so no big arguments. Those are, those are elsewhere. Read our books. Go to the other uh, lectures. Again, this is the storyline, the general storyline. So first of all, we see the sons of God again, right? They are angelic members of God's divine council. They're also called the watchers in other uh, Bible passages. We have the Nephilim, right? And the Nephilim is a transliteration. It's, it's one of those words that so, are so bizarre that they just, they don't try to interpret it. They just sort of translate it, transliterate it. It's controversial as well. My interpretation is that this, these are the giant offspring of the angels mating with human beings. So they're hybrids of heaven and earth. And so the key to this passage that I'm focusing on is that there's a violation of the heavenly earthly separation. When God creates what does it talk about? I separate. I separate man from woman. I separate, you know, uh, he separated the land from the sea. and all. So there's separation of heaven and earth. There's a separation of angel flesh and human flesh. So the key is this, uh, there's, there's a corruption going on here. They're violating that. They're, they're unifying in a way they shouldn't. Um, and the Nephilim are the first example of this seed of the serpent, right? They're the result of that. So also something that's sort of not right here, but 
uh, we talk about this a lot. Um, their goal is to corrupt the blood. So there's a corruption of the bloodline of humanity. And I, as well as if, if the Messiah comes out of the seed of the woman, then there's also an attempt to corrupt the seed of Messiah so that Messiah may not come. Uh, in Genesis 6, we read about how Noah was pure in his generation, right? And that's not just being a righteous man. That word for pure in his generation is the same word used in Leviticus about ritual purity of sacrifice, so without blemish. So actually, there's a bloodline purity going on with Noah as well. And of course, we know through Noah's line comes the Messiah. So in Noah Primeval, my first novel, I tell this story of Noah in this context from a fresh perspective that, that well, we're now getting more books like that. And you're not going to see that in the movie Noah as well. Um, but I tell it from that context, fresh perspective. And I bring into account this divine counsel worldview that is in the Bible that a lot of Christians have often missed. Now, I'm, this is going to be one, one of the only pa couple passages that are not strictly biblical, but come hear my talk on Enoch later and you'll see why it's, it's valuable. Enoch 6 says, in those days, it's talking about the Genesis 6 passage, sort of amplifying that, right? When the children of men had multiplied, it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters, and the angels saw them and desired them, and they said to one another, come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of men and beget us children. So it's talking about that, that time when the angels came down from heaven and there's a rebellion from God. And then it says this, and they were all together 200. And they descended into the summit of Hermon, Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is going to be very important because Mount Hermon in uh, ancient Near East was considered a cosmic mountain, meaning um, it was a mountain where the assembly of the watchers, these, these fallen sons of God from God's divine council, right? They come down on Mount Hermon, and this is where they have their assembly. Now, in ancient religions of the Near East, the power of the gods comes from cosmic mountains. This is why mountains are always connected to gods. And as a matter of fact, it's also in the Bible as well. But um, this is, in, even in pagan religions, the, the gods would all assemble on their cosmic mountain and they would rule from there. So this is the way that they thought back then. Now, if you're familiar with ancient Mesopotamia, the ziggurats, right, the, the pyramids, those were considered cosmic mountains and those were where the gods lived. See, so that's why they called them the cosmic mountains. And um, this is all part of this package. So, and another thing to remember is Mount Hermon is in the land of Bashan. And Bashan is just in the north, just north of Israel, but it's all part of that, that land and that world. And the word Bashan means, get this, the place of the serpent. I'm not kidding. So keep, keep this all in mind later. This is going to come into play later. In my book, Enoch Primordial, I tell this story of the original fall of the Watchers to Mount Hermon and their diabolical plan with the Nephilim to corrupt mankind, both physically and spiritually. And, you know, there's a lot of imagination and, and a lot of fiction that I add to it to fill it, to fill it out. And um, um, this is where there's a lot of speculation and, and fun. But it sort of brings that, that text alive. Now let's read First Enoch 10. And to Michael, God said, Make known to the angels who fornicated with the women, bind them for 70 generations underneath the rocks of the ground until the day of their judgment and of their consummation in the prison where they will be locked up forever. Now this corresponds actually to the New Testament, Jude 6 and 2 Peter, where it says, The angels who did not keep their domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So there's this... Um, uh, the watcher angels are in prison. Now this, of course, occurs at the time of the flood. God judges with the flood. And, uh, but he also imprisons these angels underneath the earth in Tartarus or Sheol or Hades. And they're kept there until judgment. Now, my, from my understanding is this is not all the angelic powers necessarily. These are not all the fallen watchers or all the fallen angels. But certainly they are the first ones. They are, and remember this for later, because these are sort of the angelic powers that sort of led the whole thing. So it's sort of like imagine the mafia, mafia dons being caught and thrown in jail, right? Now, this is after the flood. The flood comes, judges everyone. Uh, after the flood, Genesis 9, it says, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan, another man that out of which we, came, we, we know about the land of Canaan, and all the Canaanites came from there. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these people the whole earth were dispersed. Then Noah gets drunk, right? And then he, you know, his nakedness is uncovered by Ham. And when Noah awoke from the wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, 
a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. This is really important because all the peoples of the earth come from these three sons of Noah, and Ham was the father of Canaan. And remember, you know, Israel is going to come into the land of Canaan and take it from the Canaanites. They are cursed even back here, even back then. And we know that you know the the um, Israelites, Semites, come from Shem. Another element is Noah's nakedness. I'm not going to go into that. That's a very interesting thing. There are different theories about it. I believe that it was actually matriarchal incest, meaning Ham raped his mother. Uh, but that's not, you know, that's fascinating stuff. Read my books, you'll, you'll find out about that. But the point here is that Cain is cursed and Shem is blessed and elevated. Cain, Cain I'm not Cain, Canaan, I'm sorry. Canaan is cursed and Shem from which the Israelites, so Israel's come, Israel comes from Shem, Canaanites come from Canaan. So you've got this, already this cursing going on that's going to come up into play later. Now, let's jump ahead to Deuteronomy 32 where it talks about how, it's talking about the, this incident, it's talking about the Tower of Babel. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And then it says, Israel stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently. So this context of this passage is talking about the Tower of Babel, when God separates, divides mankind, and divides the tongues, right? He separates the nations, dividing their tongues. And in Genesis 10, we read about the 70 nations, right? And that was all the nations that they knew at the world at the time. And so you have these 70 nations and then God separating those nations but also notice the allotment language how he divides and he allots as a heritage what is that about so he allots authority under sons of God so there are sons of God or watchers in Daniel we hear the term watchers right and there are watchers who are in authority over these various nations another thing to point out here is uh, that the gods of Canaan are are called demonic and in, in, the, in the Chronicles of the Nephilim, I bring that reality out. But basically, there's this notion that these fallen watchers are demonic. Does that mean they're demons? No, but I mean, I, I think it's, it basically refers that they're demonic. And remember in Daniel 10, where you have the prince of Persia battling with Michael, who's the prince of Israel or the watcher over Israel? In Abraham Allegiant, in that novel, I tell this story of Babel. I integrate all this and in how it connects to Abraham and how Abraham is, of course, the seed in the line of Shem, right? And I think we're going to, oh, we're not there yet. But one more point I want to make is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4, it says this, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And this is God talking to Israel. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted, again, allotment, God allots nations as inheritance to these beings. God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven, but the Lord has taken you to be a people of his own inheritance. Contrast of inheritances and allotment going on here. In the ancient world, it's important to note, as well as in Israel, that word host of heaven is often referenced to, obviously, the stars and planets. However, it's used synonymously with gods. All right, And it's in the Bible, it's also used synonymously with the host of heaven around God's heavenly throne. And they are sometimes called gods, Elohim. Now, this is not a plurality of gods. This is, again, this would be a, a study that we'd have to go into. But that, that term is used of them, right? The sons of God are sort of, they're called Elohim. They're around God's council. But anyway, what I, the point I want to make here is that host of heaven is a term that's used interchangeably between these divine beings and between the stars and planets. So there's a sort of a correlation going on there. And this is another text about this allotment of nations and the inheritance. So there's a territorial authority that we see here. And um, that's important to note. Now in Genesis 22, we read, <clears throat> this is God's promise to Abraham. And this is one of the key verses I'm focusing in. Again, we're cutting a lot of stuff out. Uh, but in your seed, there's that word again. He's talking to Abraham. In your seed, all the nations, again, the nations, there's this reference of nations, of the earth shall be blessed. And because you have obeyed my voice, um, and then in Galatians 3.16, Paul explains how he goes, well, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. He didn't, it does not say, and to seeds, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So 
while I think that this seed notion does have to do with that lineage, right, the genetic lineage, ultimately I think the scriptures are saying this is ultimately pointing to Christ or Messiah. So it's that line of Messiah. So the promise appears to be almost generic in Genesis 22, but it becomes more singular in, in Paul. But I think it's a both, I see this as a both and thing in many ways, but anyway, let's keep moving. In Numbers 13, now we're jumping ahead. Why? Because there's really not much about this Nephilim and sons of God that I've found, you know, when they're, when they're in the, or when they're slaves in Egypt and stuff. So let's jump ahead. They've been slaves for 400 years and they're coming out of the promised land. They're in the Exodus now, coming out of the promised land, coming out of Egypt, going into the promised land. And the spies come back and they say, the land through which we have gone to spy out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. They're giants. And there we saw the Nephilim. Now notice this, the sons of Anak or Anakim, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. So we're skipping ahead 400 years. We're now in the Exodus on the brink of Canaan, on the territory of Canaan that God has promised. Remember territory and authority and allotment. God's going to take this for his people. Notice the sons of Anak. Another word is called the Anakim. And they come from the Nephilim. So there's this theological connection. Remember the Nephilim were first the seed of the serpent in Genesis 6? They were evil. They were the fallen progeny. It brought about the flood. Now we see that these Anakim come from the Nephilim. And so there's that theological connection of judgment that God is making this connection. So these, these giants in the land have that same judgment upon them. Again, how that all works, genetically, all that stuff, that's something to study deeper later. I'm giving you the broad picture. So there's that theological connection. And the other thing is that, of course, Anakim are Nephilim giants. Now, there are others giants as well. And let me just make that point.